Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jean Marsleem, and joining me today is Eddie Kilbain, CEO and co founder of Dataplex Group. Um, Eddie, thank you so much for joining us. How have you been um, in the last 18 months? I know you're in a hotel, you're traveling, which is quite a rarity nowadays. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a very, very large rarity these days. So yeah, so I mean, like everybody else, uh, working from home and and uh, extremely busy because clearly the market is is very buoyant at the moment. Everybody looking for more and more data center space. Um, so we've been extremely busy looking for new locations, working with clients and customers to try and see what their next move is to, and try and work with them to, to uh, address those uh, uh, their, their demand and, and their growth plans that they've got. Uh, clearly, it's allowed the market and, and uh, the clients to, to look internally what they need and, and where they want to go and, and what really the data center is going to look like now over the next 10 years. So lots of talk about sustainability, lots of talk about reducing our carbon footprint. And uh, they're things that, you know, we as a very agile company are able to work with them to, to achieve. Mm. So um, we're looking at doing that. So, yeah. So good, yeah, it's good. Very positive. Positive so, during that very negative period, I should say. Yes, yeah. Oh, there's always a silver lining. I mean, everything in yeah, life, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever. I don't think I've ever had the, the opportunity of saying uh, I've tested negative. So that's great, you know. So uh, I can deal with that <laughs> with a COVID test, you know. So. Yeah. I know. Well, it's a weekly thing now. I did mine yesterday, so <laughs> it's yeah, still negative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you mentioned the next day. What the data is going to look like in ten years' time? What will the data center of 2031 look like? Um, and what are the construction challenges that come with it? Well, I think for us all, I mean, we, we've got to look at just in terms of how we're going to um, uh, power the, gen- uh, the data centers. You know, what, what power, what backup power we're going to have. So you're going to see a lot more gas turbines going into uh, uh, that gas generation going up the site, whether it's permanent in terms of uh, because of the, the, the lack of grid capability across Europe at the moment, uh, or whether it's just temporary backup. We're going to see a lot more gas uh, turbines uh, connected as opposed to the original diesel fuel. Um, as you see more and more green hydrogen coming through, that's going to and wash through with uh, uh, not just uh, the generating plants, but our own on-site uh, temporary generating plants. So we're working with clients for that. We're working also in terms of uh, looking at higher density uh, racks and servers. So we've got a, a program working with a manufacturer and the design team in Ireland on on-chip cooling. So they're working with server uh, manufacturers about deploying uh, on-chip cooling pads internally. Uh, my own design team, then they're looking at the a hydrant system inside the data hall, retrofitting existing space to to bring those there. So the client doesn't have to strip out the whole of their infrastructure. They can replace uh, uh, additional infrastructure with uh, on-chip cooling uh, type uh, pipe work, et cetera, uh, and then still maintain that their, their, their cool systems, their, their airflow systems, because it has to be a combination of both. You're not going to just get everything uh, being uh, addressed with on-chip cooling. So you need to have some airflow as well. So it's that combination. So we've been working on that. So they're the sort of things we see. Densities are certainly going up. In the last four years, we've seen them rise from six kilowatts to eight. Now we're at 10. Um, and we're seeing 16s now becoming quite normal. So as those densities rise, we've got to find better, more efficient systems to actually uh, re- remove that heat from the data center. Uh, so heat exchangers, you know, uh, very close to the source of the heat. So you, you can start using that heat. And it's still it's still a bit grainy how hot that's going to be, but at least it can, you know, it, it can feed into a glass house or be part of a, a community uh, heat system or whatever. It can add to it or in the or within the building itself. So it's not going to replace a whole um, uh, heating systems, not at this stage, but certainly, you know, it may be in 20 years time where we see densities at 30 and 40, you may even have, you know, greater heat source that, that you can do something with. So there's some of the, 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 the footprints that we're taking at the moment, or the, sorry, the steps that we're, we're taking at the moment, so that uh, we can move forward and show that we're still innovating in terms of trying to reduce that, uh, reduce the, uh, the, the footprint that we create. As a company, our focus is always on existing buildings. So we like brownfield sites, we like existing sheds that can be repurposed, or we like old data centers that we can strip out and we can put in a new uh, fully compliant, fully operational facility. Um, But it's already a data center, so it's already got that 
footprint of, of um, the planning consent. Uh, it's already got power there, so we've got to increase the power capacity of the site. And that could be a mix of on-site generation as well as uh, as utility grid. So as a company, that's our sort of focus, and that's where we're, we're working with um, uh, existing uh, data center operators to, to see how we can take their assets. And for them as well, then, they can go back internally and say that their governance in terms of handing that over to the next uh, owner or occupier uh, is such that it's reducing their business in terms of a carbon footprint because mm. a lot of these buildings have been demolished in the past. Well, that's only adding to you know the overall unsustainability of the planet. So they're also contributing by, by disposing of that asset and someone else then demolishing it. So we're trying to repurpose it and that helps them in terms of their disposals. So you know it's a win-win for everybody. And for the clients, it means that we can deliver a um, product quicker to the market. We're looking at the third, the second, the, the, the top, the, the low end of the second tier market and the third tier markets is where we're looking at. We're looking at those next edge locations that customers are going to need, the five to 20 megawatt type footprints, uh, always with growth potential, but uh, they're the sort of solutions. Uh, mm-hmm. Other things we're doing, we're working with people who are doing waste to energy plants uh, to try and locate close to them so we can do behind the wire connections. Again, sustainable energy, sustainable uh, footprints. Um, and really, it is all about that. That is the biggest driver we've seen under COVID. That's the focus because it's allowed people to sit back and say, this is this has caught us all unawares, but if we need to move forward, what do we need to do? Um, and, and if you look at some of the big hyperscale uh, uh, statements that have been made about the fact that they'd all like to be carbon neutral at 2025, 2030, and you see how many wind farms and solar plants they're buying and investing in, you know, they're going to achieve those aims by just having their own sources of of, yeah. uh, of power generation we can't do that we're not a big enough industry to do that our companies to do that so we've got to look at them how do we also help them and work with them then to do other things and that's really our driver and we have a good team we've new we've new uh, uh new uh, group of uh of very seasoned professionals who've now joined the business and that's helping me because it's bringing new ideas and new experiences into the company so it's a, it's a huge asset Okay, so there's quite a lot of follow-ups there. Uh, big, big yet maybe on the hyperscale is building their own renewable energy plants. Um, compared to our industry, that we probably don't have the means to do it, or most certainly mm. most companies around the world don't have the means to do it. Do you see that changing, ever changing? Because we, we've seen a lot of green bonds being um, being done in the last few months, in the last two years. Um, is our industry going to focus more on just getting energy from the grid, or we will get into actually building our own solar, wind farms? Um, well, I mean, okay, so, you know, having just pure solar and wind and those types of, you know, renewable energies, it's great, but it doesn't stabilize the grid. So you're still going to need some sort of generation that's going to create the frequency the network needs to stabilize it. So I think it's going to be a combination. I think with green gas coming, green energy gas coming through hydrogen, I think that's going to help. I think we're going to see more forms of um, more sustainable gas production which will then help those generating plants. Um, and what I do see is that the, you know, the hyperscalers are so cash rich, they don't mind spending money on things that are very far out there um, to do that. Um, certainly what we've seen from my experience in Ireland is that you know, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Google, they've all, they've all bought wind farms in their own name. So not just buying the capacity on it, but buying the ownership as well. So that they own that, and they'll have the right for that use then for the you know in perpetual. Um, they're the sort of investments those guys are making. And if you think about where they've come from, from just offering originally software services and then online services to owning their own data centers, most of those companies now are the largest owners of fiber in the world. So why do we not think that they won't then also invest in grid or in other energy sources to make sure that their business is in, isn't interrupted and is stable? And some of the things we're seeing across Europe at the moment, uh, you know, come to, to come to an end because it, there isn't a country in Europe at the moment, apart from France, possibly, with all of its um, nuclear energy that isn't hit by governments insisting you've got to close down coal plants, you've got to close down pea plants like in Ireland and in Poland, or you've got to start reducing your reliance on fossil fuels for gas. You start got to invest in hydrogen uh, production uh, so that you can have that mix. They're the challenges that the grid faces. The biggest challenge the grid faces, though, is the age of the grid. The physical cables that leave those generating plants are at an age where, the, you know, the volume of power going through them today is what they were expecting in 30, 35 and much later. 
but the power's going through today because of the demand. And that's a bigger challenge. So, um, and they're things that aren't going to be quick to fix because they're massive infrastructure projects in within themselves, you know? So, uh, and we've all got to work together to help that. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you, like, what would you like to be, to see to be done um, in that space? Would you like governments to step in more? Would you like taxes to help? Um, not just degrees, but also the data center operators changing um, their consumption. What can Europe do um, to help solve this problem? Because not all countries have their grids, as, it's not, or not all countries have their grids controlled by the governments anyway. Um, no, they don't. Of, I mean, look, uh, you know, at some level, you know, I think that there's been a lot of money invested in those there, uh, but a lot of shareholders have taken a lot of dividends out without probably investing in even further. Uh, I think their time to uh, continue the investment uh, was, be, was was completely um out of tilter to what was happening with Moore's law, if nothing else, just in terms of what's happening in industry, in in, in the world, in everything we do, whether it's car manufacturing or or shipbuilding, whatever, technologies, you know, keep changing, you know, uh, as law and more suggest. But the grids didn't. They sat and they didn't look for accelerated programs or accelerated times to replace. They didn't look at ways of, of burying the cables so they, 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 they lasted longer, you know? Uh, you know. They didn't do things that were simple at the time. And governments and industry and people paid a lot of taxes back then to do it. And I think that those investments need to be looked at again and, and either taken off them and, and, or redistributed or new investment put into there. I don't think the common people can pay additional taxes and certainly it's not the data center's business to pay additional taxes because we're paying for the base load then for those generating plants to stay up, okay? Mm. But nobody's invested in the grid because they've taken all the money and they've used it in other things. Uh, so I think there's there's got to be a bit of a reckoning um, and I think people have got to bury their heads in the sand that it isn't the data center's responsibilities to start building micro energy, uh, micro energy plants and providing island power for their own buildings or alternative power for the grid itself. That's not their job. That's generating plants and, and, and you know, the, the, uh, the, the national grids themselves. So, um, and I've, I say that because of the, the, the recent CIU uh, documentation or consultative process that was in Ireland recently. The same is going to happen in England and the same is going to happen in Germany uh, just because of the demand that's being put on there. You know? So um, it, th there is going to be challenges. You know, In the UK last year, we seen the, in 2019, we've seen the first brownouts. A brownout when a, a power station or a substation up in Newcastle got hit. And that's something that... So something fundamentally went wrong with the grid and they're the things that worry industry and worry everybody uh, mm. that it, it couldn't have been recovered. So, you know, the, the grid in itself has to look at into its own business and find out what the situation is. I wouldn't suggest for a minute that it's the hyperscaler's role to go and invest in those grids. I don't know, but will they or can they? I, I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> cool. And um, Eddie, if people want to learn more about Dataplex and what you do and um, hear your next uh, wave of news stories coming out, where could they go? So we have our website, clearly, dataplexgroup.com. Um, and, you know, those who know me in the industry can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to share, happy to, to, to give people my opinion and share my, our experiences and also to give some advice as well when uh, people are sort of, uh, you know, uh, are challenged in terms of what to do next. You know, So happy to help, you know. The industry is great. There's some really lovely people around, uh, always good people to give you good, solid advice. Um, in Ireland, we've been blessed with people like Forrest Mortel and, and uh, Brendan Gagan, as well as Colm himself, who uh, gives great advice. And in the UK, we got the likes of Matt Pullen and, and Andrew Jay and, and uh, Duncan Club. They're, 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 you know, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice association to be in. As a vertical, yeah, it's great to be in it. Uh, there's enough room for everyone. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a, good, it's a good, uh, good industry to be in. It is indeed a great industry to be in, and we all fell into it almost by mistake. I'll say exactly. nine out of ten. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I haven't yeah, met yeah. a single person that has chosen the industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. <laughs> um, Eddie Kilvane, CEO of Dataplex, thank you so much for talking to us. And uh, thank you, our viewers, for tuning into JSA TV and JSA Podcasts. And don't forget to check our social channels for more content. Until next time, happy networking. Yes, lovely talking to you. You take care. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.